our sixth session. Today we have uh, Ms. Tripti to take a session for us. So we can start with our presentation and followed by its discussion. So over to Smriti ma'am. Hi everybody. Uh, nice to see you all again. Uh, hi Tripti. Thanks for thanks for being here with us today. Uh, for those of you who uh, are meeting Tripti for the first time or uh, hearing about her work for the first time, Tripti is the deputy. Is it audible? Okay, so uh, Tripti is the deputy director with Lawyers Collective, one of the oldest uh, human rights organizations in the country. And uh, Tripti has worked across uh, several areas, uh, including, uh, you know, challenging that mandatory uh, death penalty for, uh, for drug users. Uh, sorry, is there some disturbance? Also, she's worked extensively on HIV and uh, well, drug policy and human rights. I should I should specify that, and uh, that's that's an important uh, distinction to make. Very often, uh, drug control policies in our country come from a space of uh, criminal justice rather than uh, than human rights and public health. And as we go along, that is something that we'll be talking about uh, with a little, in a little more detail. Uh, and uh, we, we talk about a balanced and rational policy for access to drug control, I mean to essential medicines rather. Um, and uh, globally, this, is, this, this principle of balance has been quite difficult to achieve. I don't think it's really been achieved in too many places. And uh, that is something that uh, we as a palliative care organization also advocate for, that while yes, there should be controls on uh, preventing the diversion of, of um, of narcotic substances for uh, for illicit use, it should in no way create a barrier to accessing it for people who are in pain and in need. So there is a balance that has to be struck, and uh, so we'll touch upon that also, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, I think for us, the most significant connection with Tripti is that Tripti has been very deeply involved in our in our struggle to amend the Narcotics, uh, Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act of 1985, which was such a draconian act and uh, was, uh, was responsible for uh, putting up all those barriers to access in our own country. So Tripti has been a very vital part of that journey. And uh, we're very glad that uh, she made the time to actually take us through this because I can't think of a better person to do it. So thanks, Tripti, and uh, over to you. here with all of you i understand um, that you're all from very diverse backgrounds and uh, uh, really uh, working on different aspects aspects that you think are important parts of uh, advocacy and the movement forward for uh, access to palliative care so i'm today going to deal with a very small but perhaps very significant part of that um, movement for advocacy, that movement for better access to palliative care, which is really about medicines and accessing medicines, which was uh, a problem for patients, which was a problem for doctors, and how the law was a barrier, and how all of us together helped change uh, and overcome uh, that barrier. To some extent, there's a rider to that, but I will come to uh, that aspect later. So, um, we have the next slide, please. Yeah. So, um, as I said, pain relief is a part of palliative care. I understand palliative care is much wider, and pain is just one part. But uh, it's it's a very important part. From what I have heard from my interactions with doctors, with Dr. Raj Gopal in particular, and other caregivers, pain is really. Um, quite critical and relief from pain is one of the first few most immediate things that you need to do uh, with, uh, uh, with people uh, with debilitating conditions. And um, like I said, access to medicines for treating pain is very important. But the issue that we cannot have access, though we have medicines, but our patients can't access was actually identified by doctors, by palliative care physicians and uh, uh, healthcare providers like Dr. Raj Gopal. It wasn't something that 
patients identified. It wasn't something that the government on its own identified or even NGOs or, you know, activists identified. It was really something that doctors, because of their personal interaction with patients and the fact that they knew that there are medicines available for treating. So it was really the doctor's frustration that became uh, the starting point for our uh, efforts to work um, in this area and um, conduct uh, policy advocacy. Now, as doctors identified the issue, they also identified where the problem lay. And this was, uh, could you turn the next slide, please? So this was um, a, you know, a publication in the Lancet. I think Dr. Raj Gopal and, and others from uh, the WHO and the International Pain and Palliative Care Studies uh, put out this, uh, uh, this study in the Lancet, which showed how the uh, Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act, which came in in 1985 and introduced a a dual regime for uh, controlling narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances, the dual regime being one of prohibition as well as regulation. So some things were just outrightly prohibited under the law and some things were regulated. And with this law coming into force over several years, uh, doctors were able to uh, map statistics to show that the country's consumption of morphine, the primary medicine used for pain relief, fell by 97%. So this is a very, very drastic uh, fall that uh, medical consumption of morphine had fallen, like literally gone to zero. And this figure coincides with the enforcement of the NDPS Act. So uh, having, just turn to the next please. Having identified that the law was posing a problem, let's try and figure out what that problem really was. So uh, under the NDPS Act, like I said, it's a dual framework of prohibition and regulation. And there are certain drugs which are uh, included under the Act. These drugs are primarily classified into three um, heads. The first is narcotic drugs. And within that, there's something called manufactured drugs. I, I'll come to this distinction a little later. But uh, the drug that we, are, we were most concerned with, which is morphine, was a manufactured drug and a narcotic drug. The second category is psychotropic substances. And uh, some of these also, some of these are used for pain relief purposes, but some are used for other, uh, um, you know, other medical purposes, such as, so you have Zolpidem, you have Alprazolam, now you have Tramadol, you have, you know, various, various drugs which are psychotropic. Then there's something called controlled substances, which also have uh, medical use, but we're not going to, uh, we're not concerned so much with controlled substances right now. Now, very important to understand, though, as Priti rightly pointed out, the NDPS Act was a very, very dra draconian law with uh, extreme punishment starting from 10 years, going up to 20, 30 years for very um, small and minor um, violations. What is important to understand is that narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances are not legal or illegal in themselves. So most of the times people have this perception that any substance under the NDPS Act is illegal. That it's a, it's a crime to have this substance. But that is not the case. It is not drugs that are legal or illegal in themselves, but a legality of a particular drug or a substance depends on two things. The first is, what purpose is that drug being used for? And under the NDPS Act, medical and scientific purposes are legitimate purposes. So as far as we are concerned in the palliative care movement, the use of morphine or um, um, uh, you know, methadone or 
codeine or any other even 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 for that matter if you could say heroin if it is for a medical purpose then that purpose is legitimate the second thing is that in addition to the purpose there's something called how is that drug to be used the manner in which it is obtained the manner in which it is procured all of that is also will also determine whether you are on the right side of the law or the wrong side and that manner has to be the procuring and use has to be in accordance with the ndps act the ndps rules as well as any license or permission that you may get under the act or the rules so if you satisfy these two things there is nothing illegal about uh, narcotic drugs or psychotropic substances so in fact the entire medical and pharmaceutical sector is on the right side of the law because they satisfy both the the legality in terms of purpose as well as the manner in which these drugs are used so i really wanted to uh, make this um, point very clear that under ndps we talk about medical use we don't talk about medical drugs because drugs may be medical you may procure them from a pharmacy but if you use them for non medical purpose then that becomes an offense so this 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 is something very important to bear in mind can we move to the next slide yeah so uh, like i mentioned doctors were able to identify through statistics that the uh, reduction in morphine consumption uh by by patients by uh, the medical sector coincided with the enforcement of the ndps act now what were the problems in the ndps act that uh, uh, that uh, doctors and patients uh, in need of palliative care were facing so the first is that the medicines used for pain relief are primarily opioids and opioids fall under various different categories of uh, uh, substances of under the ndps act so and these these different categories are very complicated i don't want to burden you with all of this but some of this is the you know old colonial lineage that we had our uh, drug control was primarily developed by the british colonial government and when we introduced the ndps act in 85 we retained some of those colonial ideas but then also brought in some new things from uh, the international uh, drug conventions so these colonial categories ideas and definitions were retained in the law now as a result if you are to navigate something say for morphine you would have to look at very several sections in the law to see okay what am i going to do with morphine how am i going to get it from point a to point b because it's coming under so many different overlapping categories the second problem in the law was that the regulatory powers were bifurcated between the center central government and different state governments depending on what is the drug what is the activity that is regulated and who is the authority again this is sounding really complicated but i will uh, won't get into detail but just give you some uh, basic illustrative idea so for instance morphine which i said is a manufactured drug under the ndps act so as far as its manufacturers concerned its production by companies is concerned that is done under the regulation or rule made by the government of india but other aspects of morphine such as who can possess it how can it be transported how can it be sold how can it be used how can it be consumed all of this is developed by the state governments under their own individual state level rules um if you come to the next slide please so state rules and the heart of the problem for accessing morphine and other pain relief medicines in the palliative care movement 
lay in this in the different rules that different state governments had for these medicines now the first thing is that when we are talking about accessing morphine for a patient for a cancer patient procuring morphine for them we may say okay i have to get this medicine but in that simple act of getting this medicine you are actually encroaching on various different uh, parts of the law so to get that medicine the first thing is that the medicine has to be manufactured so there is a manufacturer the second thing is that it must come from the manufacturer to the distributor now in from manufacture to distribution there are several activities such as transport such as stocking such as possession then from the distributor to the supplier which could be at, at, at a retail or at a hospital or at a pharmacy again you have multiple activities under the law so one simple act of getting the medicine to the patient entails many activities under the law each of which have require their own license so under the state rules you had one license for manufacture one license for transporting so between transporting the person who's sending the medicine to the person who's carrying the medicine to the person who's receiving the medicine supply each of these entities needed licenses and all these licenses needed to be valid at the same time in order for the transaction of manufacture to uh, final use by the patient to be 100% legitimate and clear under the law now different states had different rules different states had different licenses and had different agencies also for giving licenses some of these um, licenses and rules had very very onerous restrictions so one uh, state that i vividly remember was uh, goa and in the goa ndps rules they had a requirement that the patient who needs morphine must personally be present with their prescription before the um, i think it was the collector district collector have their prescription stamped and only then approach the pharmacy for filling in and one prescription was perhaps allowed you to have medication for two or three weeks i can't remember the details but it was that inhuman and that onerous but those were the kinds of conditions that different states had then we had a lot of inconsistency between states so for, from my memory uh, up the state of up every every license was given by the excise department now the excise department is not part of the the health uh, system that we have they sit outside they you know they deal primarily with accessible taxable goods uh, and they would treat drugs including medicines including morphine etc akin to other other drugs or alcohol or other intoxicant drugs they would not treat it as a medical or medicinal commodity so their approach to anyone who applied for a license to be able to manufacture morphine or distribute it was very different as compared to say kerala or tamil nadu or other states where they understood that these are primarily health related and therefore any license any regulation for these for morphine or other opioids was in the remit of the state drug controller which is part of the health system so it was a very inconsistent picture that we had the other major problem in the state rules was that so the state of goa can make rules for activities only in goa but if a medicine had to be transported from say maharashtra to goa that would amount to import and export interstate normally import and export is used 
within and outside the country, but under the NDPS Act, we had import and export within the country itself. So one state to the other also was akin to export and import, which meant that the person had to have licenses from different states. So, I mean, all of this is clearly showing that the problem was really, it was very difficult to access a basic medicine like morphine. Worse still, some states did not bother to carve out a regulatory framework. They had no rules. So as a result, when there's no rule, means you cannot access. And the state of Punjab was one such state that vividly comes to my mind that for a long time did not make any rules to allow uh, patients to access these medicines. Could you move to the next slide, please? Next slide, please. So what I just described to you was actually documented uh, by uh, Dr. Raj Gopal and other uh, re re international researchers. And that then became a part of what had to be handled. So to come back, like I said, the NDPS has a dual regime. The prohibition regime, which is very heavy punishments, very stringent uh, criminal justice procedures. And then there was the regulatory part, which meant that you are allowed to do these things, but you're allowed only when you do it in a certain way. For us, we were always concerned about the regulatory part and not so much about the prohibitory part because, like I said, medical use of opioids is permissible. Whether or not we should worry about the draconian part is something we need to figure out later and I'll we'll probably have a discussion over that. But our concern was primarily the regulations which were extremely onerous. Next, please. So having identified the legal barrier and also having identified where the problem lay and the problem, as I said, primarily lay in the fact that different states had different rules and which made access impossible. What were the efforts made by uh, civil society, by palliative care physicians and uh, others in the movement to uh, make change? So the first part was really about working with the government and asking the government to simplify the, the rules and regulations. So doctors and WHO worked with the Department of Revenue. Department of Revenue is the, is the policy uh, authority or the legislative authority under the NDPS Act. And uh, they are the ones who actually um, make the law or issue notifications or issue rules, etc. as far as the central government is concerned. So initially the attempt was to firstly work with the Department of Revenue and convince them into issuing, you know, giving states instructions to please simplify your rules, please make it easy. They tried doing that, but a lot of states did not accept the message. And this is primarily because of the federal structure that we have. So many state governments just refused to follow the advice that the Department of Revenue gave or followed it, but again tweaked their rules to make it st uh, still uh, difficult. Simultaneously, uh, palliative care physicians and team also started working with individual states to say, okay, we'll work with each state so that they simplify their uh, rules for ensuring access. This also worked. Many states did come forward and made changes in their rules or simplified their systems, but many did not. So the problem was not fully resolved. And, and the other problem which I mentioned, which is interstate import and export from one state to the other, remained as it was. So even if one state had favorable provisions, the other states had difficult uh, systems, so access remained a problem. Thereafter, there was an attempt and a feeling that if we go to court, 
through say public interest litigation and get the court to pass orders asking the government to provide supply medicines to cancer patients then maybe that's something that will work so there was a litigation way back in 1998 in delhi and uh, delhi high court asked the government to provide medicines uh, uh, for for pain relief and subsequently there was a petition filed in the supreme court in 2007 but again this was not really um, helping because a high court orders were limited to one state and with the petition in the supreme court where all the states uh, were made to respond it just took a very very long time because when you have one case and you have some 26 27 states they all take their own sweet time to drag the case on to not do anything and hearing after hearing things were just just not progressing so uh, it was around this time that um, um, that dr raj gopal and others from palium india uh, came to our office at the lawyers collective in in delhi with human rights watch and we kind of started working together, exploring how we could work together as uh, health and human rights oriented lawyers and as physicians working on palliative care. And um, uh, while we were, you know, working together, say on, on cases or, or, or just suggestions on how to move forward, there was a fortuitous uh, development that took place, which was that the, the government uh, central government itself introduced changes to the NDPS Act by way of proposing an NDPS Amendment Bill 2011. This was introduced in the Lok Sabha but did not contain any provision in relation to access to opioids for pain relief. Though we had been advocating with the government for the last, say, about uh, you know. 10 15 years they just didn't pick up the issue when they were developing uh, amendments to the law they were more concerned about other enforcement related objectives and not about the health oriented aspects of the law Shall i have the next slide please so it was at this time that uh, we decided that we will take this opportunity and try and achieve what we wanting to achieve which is simplified rules and regulations for medical access which are uniform across the country that this is something we will achieve through the law not simply through government advice and directives or court orders but we will make that part and parcel of the NDPS Act itself and uh, that is when we started uh, formally working together and we developed certain principles on the basis of which the law must uh, must work and the first principle was that while the NDPS Act allows medical use of opioids it doesn't see it as priority so our first message was that internationally and nationally medical use is as important as preventing misuse because the international drug conventions themselves recognize that narcotics are indispensable for health and welfare that message somehow seemed to have gotten lost and the NDPS Act became primarily a law enforcement tool and its health and regulatory aspects were somehow lost out on the authority. So one of our attempts um, at this stage was to really drive home the health and medical aspects of the law and bring it into, um, uh, into the spotlight. This was also uh, seen in, in the principle of balance, which is internationally talked about, which Ms. Prithi also alluded to in her introduction. That balance means that while you prevent misuse, you also don't take 
regulations to a level that even access becomes a casualty. So you have to strike a balance between restricting and preventing misuse or abuse of medicines while at the same time making sure that they are available for those who need it. And this is something we are still struggling with with our, with our work with the authorities as the minute you tell them anything about narcotic medicines, the first, no, 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 but these are bad things. These are, these are drugs. These are addictive. These are misused. Of course, we have to check misuse. But in trying to check misuse, we cannot stop legitimate medical use. That is the first thing and the first lesson that we drove home in our work with the government. So we also told the government that, look, the problem is not that the NDPS Act doesn't allow medical use. The problem is that the system that it has set up, that frustrates access. So, you know, I don't know if some of you may have heard news that there was some petition filed in the Delhi High Court by somebody wanting to legalize cannabis for medical use and the, the court has just thrown it out. Again, I want to bring this out that medical use is allowed under NDPS. It is not that it is not allowed. It's allowed. It's just that the systems to access these medicines for uh, pain And this is what we were trying to correct. And we also uh, furthered our um, kind of uh, advocacy with the government by saying, look, India is producing morphine, but people outside, patients outside are getting it. It's all of it is exported. Our patients back home are suffering because we are not concerned about how we treat our people, but we are only concerned about exporting these uh, medicines. And then we also, of course, pointed out to good practices, such as in states like Kerala, where you have a fairly well-regulated and easy access uh, model. And at the same time, there is no diversion. Again, you know, studies that uh, Palium India and Dr. Raj Gopal put together to show that there are good practices that can be followed. Next slide. So while these were the principles that guided our uh, law reform efforts, what was the process that we adopted? So uh, on the first, uh, the first occasion when the NDPS amendment bill was introduced in parliament, it was referred to a standing committee. And it was at this standing committee that uh, we had uh, demanded that there be adequate uh, changes made even for uh, for, for medical aspects. The committee somehow didn't take too much notice of uh, this, but they did say when, when the pharma companies made their submission that uh, some of these concerns need to be looked. To engage with the Department of Revenue, the Ministry of Finance. And this was quite a task. And let me tell you that at the Lawyers Collective, we've been involved with several, um, you know, law reform and uh, advocacy with several marginalized communities and, and, and issues. This was one issue, access of, for uh, patients, where there was no resistance. In principle, nobody had a problem with the idea that patients in pain should not suffer or the idea that patients in pain should be able to access medicines for pain relief. In principle, everybody agreed that yes, this is something that we need to do. The problem is that the government was just not willing to say that it's because of the law or the NDPS Act that patients can't access. They would time and again say, no, 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 law is okay. You have to just sensitize the, the, uh, the officials. If you sensitize the officials, you will get your things, uh, get your medicines. So they would, instead of looking at the law as being the site of the problem, they would look at attitudes of, say, the regulatory authorities or the need for sensitization. And they would say, please, yes, uh, Palium India should do sensitization and that will be the end of the problem. 
but we kept telling them that for the last 20, 25 years, we have done all amounts of sensitization and workshops, yet there is a problem. So unless you then resolve the problem from its core, no amount of uh, patchwork of sensitizing here, there will really work. And it took a very long time to convince the Department of Revenue that, that the law needs to change. And this was done through repeated meetings and submissions and charts and this and that, that we would, uh, you know, Pelium India and others in the palliative care community and us would work together. So today when I look back at my server, I can find like hundreds of documents of submission A, submission B, submission dated this, 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 so lots of lots of documents and uh, work that we put together. Then finally, uh, we managed to convince the government, the Department of Revenue, to agree to introducing changes in the law. And because the amendment bill was still pending in Parliament, it was an opportunity for us to make further changes in that very amendment bill, which is something that we did. We drafted uh, specific language in the law, which would take care of uh, our concerns. And that language was accepted by the Ministry of Finance and they formally moved amendments to the NDPS Act in relation to uh, medical access um, in 2014. And while at one level there was this kind of intense work going on with the government, at the other level there was also work going on with the media and with members of parliament. because. Um, unless the media really picked up the issue, the chances of MPs taking up the amendment was quite slim. And uh, there were lots of hundreds of letters that patients, survivors, caregivers, family members sent to individual MPs and parties urging them to pass the NDPS amendments. Um, and some such letters were extremely moving they did because uh, when the next slide please next slide, yeah so finally after uh, very very painstaking efforts and almost losing the bill because of the chaos that prevailed in parliament at that time finally in february 2015, 2014 the ndps amendments were passed by parliament uh, the president assented in march and they came into force in May 2014. So it was literally what, 85 to yeah, 30 years. 30 years it took, but uh, we did finally manage to change uh, the law. Next slide, please. And I, I, I don't know if you can read the text, but this is a speech uh, made by the, the, at the high level meeting internationally at the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, where India very proudly spoke about changing uh, the NDPS Act. And if you see somewhere down below, the secretary is uh, commending civil society, saying such amendments were drafted with the active participation of civil society and the palliative care community. And with these amendments, our drug enactment incorporates the principle of balance espoused by the UN Drug Control Convention. So this was really um, you know, a proud moment for all of us who worked on, on these uh, uh, amendments and also for the country to have really uh, moved forward on this important agenda. Next slide. So very briefly, what were the amendments that were enacted in 2014? So the first was that we created a, a new category of drugs called essential narcotic drugs, which the central government can notify. So this is an open-ended category. It's not fixed, but as and when the government feels that there is there are new drugs that are needed for pain relief, and these drugs are, are narcotics, it can move it into the essential narcotic drugs category and have uh, simplified regulations. The regulations and rules for essential narcotic drugs are to be made by the central government. 
and not the state government. So that if it's central government, the rules and procedures will be uniform throughout the country. They will not vary from state to state or uh, agency to agency or drug to drug. And then uh, lastly, we also uh, managed to get provisions in the law which said the NDPS Act is not just concerned with preventing illicit uh, dr drug use and misuse, but it's equally concerned with the objective of promoting medical and scientific use of uh, NDPS substances. Next, please. Now, what was the the, uh, the thinking behind the concept of essential narcotic drugs. And uh, this I can share with you because this is something that I've you know, personally worked on and kind of coined this phrase. So what, what was the thinking behind this? The first reason for doing this was that it would help us get past those very complicated overlapping, overlapping categories of narcotics and manufactured and opiate and this and that. The word essential conveys that this is important. It conveys its meaning and purpose and it also adds that sense of you cannot do without these. Uh, Thirdly, like I said, these drugs can be notified by the government. You don't need to change the act or the rules. You don't need to go to parliament to add new substances or other drugs that become uh, necessary for patients. They will be subject to uniform central rules. And most importantly, and this is again coming back to the principle of balance, that even if, the, if these drugs are used for illicit purposes, there is no change in the punishment. So this is the principle of balance, that we have not diluted the law or made it weak as far as illegal uh, activity is concerned. But at the same time, we have tried to create systems so that its um, uh, legitimate medical use is um, uh, not impaired. By the law. Next, please. So, a year later, the government notified these uh, six, no, five, six, sorry, six uh, drugs as essential narcotic drugs. And um, you can see morphine is there, codeine, fentanyl. Um, you know, the, the government really didn't say on what basis they notified these drugs and not others, but I think they did take uh, inputs from palliative care physicians, from uh, state drug controllers, from the Indian pharmaceutical industry, and that's how they came up with this list. Uh, next, please. So... The act was amended, but now to operationalize the act and actually make these medicines available, we needed to have central rules under the NDPS Act, or what are called NDPS rules. And these two were developed in uh, May 2015. And they were heavily influenced by the model uh, of recognized medical institution, which was practiced in uh, Kerala. And the choice of the licensing authority was uh, the state drug controller and not any other agency. Because the experience in Kerala with the state drug controller was quite positive. So therefore, we've now we brought this into the, the central uh, system. So that in every state, it is the state drug controller who's responsible for essential narcotic drugs and not excise or collector or customs or other police authorities. The, these rules need fixing, to be honest. There are several problems because perhaps they were done in a hurry and the government wasn't too cognizant of many other issues. And that is something that the government has promised us that they're working on. Um, and as a result, I have to be candid here. I think there are still problems and the problem is largely because now you have 
central government ministry of finance making rules and the implementation is done by state governments state drug controllers who are responsible to the ministry of health so that the link the line department which is how usually government systems work has been broken in this case so there is there, there are still some basic uh, teething problems in getting the state drug controllers to understand the central system and things like that so there, there there's work to be done on, on this I, I won't get into detail but i have to be honest with you we don't have a perfect system still next slide and this is my last slide before we open up for questions and discussion to some of some ideas about what the process of advocacy really was and why was it that we succeeded or what was what was different um, in this in this advocacy and in this campaign as opposed to some other campaigns uh, for law reform that we see so i think the first uh, take home message for me is that people who are in the field the caregivers the doctors they just didn't stop with identifying the problem but they were determined to change it, think about solutions they just didn't say okay now this is the problem somebody else will change the problem they actually started intervening in the system to be able to come up with and craft solutions um the approach of the palliative care movement was one of working with the government whether it was the central government or the state government it was essentially a collaborative approach it was essentially an approach saying look this is a problem we'd like to work with you to change it now i i driving home this point is because many other movements many other social movements or uh, reform movements take take a slightly confrontationalist approach towards the government uh, especially if you know things don't change for a long time that they don't then they don't shy away from confronting the government or making demands or you know staging protests or uh, really expressing uh, anger at the status quo or at the uh, the state of affairs that that doesn't seem to change but with the palliative uh, care community it was always about working with the government it wasn't about protesting it wasn't about pressing one's uh, displeasure i'm not discounting those means i think those are those are important and uh, you know maybe a time will come that sometimes you do have to make your demand fairly strongly and aggressively but as far as these changes were concerned it was primarily a collaborative effort of working with with the government and different agencies the third thing that really strikes me um as a part of the collaborative uh, movement was that we explored many different avenues for making change so every option was kept open so the first option was working with the government getting the government to uh, to sit on the table and develop solutions such as the simplified rules or directives to state the other option was going to court that too was explored and put to use and then the other option was to ask parliament to change law so it was never the idea was never fixed that this is what we need and this is how we'll do it there was always a willingness to see and explore what will work what will not work and then putting uh, uh, the different steps together and i hope that this is something that we will continue to do as we explore the next stage of making the law work and fit to uh, fit a purpose also there was a lot of willingness to shift strategy not be fixated on any one thing um and uh, 
also another thing was collaborating with uh, with other stakeholders so you know the palliative care doctors didn't think that they could do it all by themselves the, the patients and caregivers also didn't think that they could do it by themselves it was really everybody coming together including us as lawyers um, or others um, as uh, activists come really coming together and uh, working on this so really this these are some of my thoughts the one thing that i do want to say um, is like i said we were working with the government and maybe one slight weakness of working with the government is uh, that we were not able to frame access to opioids at least in india though internationally it has been done as a matter of fundamental rights and right to life and right to health there were attempts there were some feeble attempts in writing about it in that manner but in our work with with government with the court or with parliament it was not really framed as a matter of fundamental rights would it have made any difference would it have you know strengthened the movement or would it have made us slightly more confrontationalist i'm not sure I don't know. I think that's something for all of us to think about. But um, yeah, the fact is that it was not framed as a right to uh, as a rights issue. It was really something that was a matter of collaboration uh, with with the government. So uh, that's about it from me on the presentation. And questions. <laughs> Um, I just want to thank you, Tripti, because uh, what you've done with this presentation is twofold. One is you have familiarized all of us with actually what really went into making this happen. You know, today we talk about the RMI, we talk about all of this, but uh, today you told us what the story really was and it, what a tremendous effort. And uh, I mean, thank you really for being, I don't know how many of us really get the chance to talk to you directly like that. So thank you for being such a champion. Uh, I think uh, all of us here who are, who are associated with palliative care have a lot to thank you for. So thanks for that. Um, the second uh, part, the second thing that you've shown us is, um, you know, what it takes, uh, of course, is one aspect, but uh, how we ourselves as advocates should not be discouraged when something takes time and how to really frame the problem is so important, you know, rather than you know, doing the next best thing and the next best thing to really understand the problem and then conceptualize problem solving techniques that will lead us to solving, resolving the issue. Uh, that's so important. And persistence and resilience, of course, is something that all of us have to be prepared to have. And uh, nothing, uh, nothing important is ever accomplished overnight. Um, I just want to share a small personal experience. Um, I remember the day. Uh, the amendment was done when we heard about it and uh, the call came in after 5 30 and you know all of us we was we were waiting with bated breath we weren't sure if it was going to happen like you said it was all just this almost hit and miss and then it was pretty much the last thing that was done that day that was passed uh, if i remember correctly and i remember putting the phone down because um, um, in my own case my mother had uh, had a horrible two-year experience and she died a very very painful death and in that moment, it suddenly became clear to me that that need not be the case. You know, I mean, this was the beginning of a, of a, of a new phase where people did not have to die the way she did and uh, where we were just outright denied this, this what should be a right. And um, I remember very clearly my hands shaking. I was so emotional about it. And then I called my brother and I told him, I said, you know, this has happened. And it seemed like such a remote law had been changed. But the impact on each of us who have or are caregivers or are living with life limiting conditions. I think uh, this is this really hits close to home. It's not a procedural thing or it's not a it's not a you know legislation sitting somewhere in some high offices. This has a direct impact on so many of our lives. And I think that connection we should always, always uh, remember to see. So, so thank you. And 
questions, comments from the rest of the participants, please. Shri Vidya. Good afternoon. Actually, I felt uh, very emotional. Uh, this whole uh, thing was like uh, Indian freedom struggle, you know, <laughs> from 1857 to 1857. It took like 90 years. More than that, I don't know. <laughs> and one third of that, like see, 30 years it took uh, to relieve the pain of many uh, victims of pain. What uh, for whatever they are suffering, and uh, it was very very uh, informational, and uh, it looked so complicated. You know, this many steps have been taken uh, to do uh, something for the patients. So uh, I promise that when I start my own palliative unit. I had a dream of keeping uh, the fort of Dam Sicily Saunders and Dr. Raj Gopal. And uh, in addition to that, for all these pioneers and uh, lawyers and whoever fought this fight, I promise I'll keep all their photos in my unit. <laughs> really, it was like that. You know, my heart rate <laughs> increased to almost 200. Okay. So my first question is, I have a dream of starting my own unit, if at all I get good doctors with me and uh, we are saving a lot of money for that dream also. So if I want to really get a permission uh, to bring these uh, ENDs to my unit, so what are all the departments I have to go? That is my first question uh, that is lingering, you know. It looked so complicated. Is it really possible or not? I am really <laughs> doubt, doubtful. So first, please uh, answer or explain something which can help me to reduce my heartbeat, <laughs> heart rate. <laughs> Should I answer? Yes, please. Okay, so uh, um, uh, thank you for your question and for sharing your sentiments. Uh, I, I think you, from instead of keeping the lawyer's photograph, you really need to keep the legal provisions in, <laughs> in your uh, unit when it comes up, and I'm sure it will come up because, uh, like I mentioned, we only just dealt with one part of the problem with is which is simplifying the regulations but the regulations still exist so if there's any slight violation of the regulation we will have have a difficult situation so um, instead of lawyers photographs i think you should have the legal provision uh, in place uh, very firmly uh, in your setup Actually, um, I wasn't sure whether this session also uh, required me to share what the current uh, norms and regulations for ENDs are. Uh, so I didn't cover that at all. I thought this was more of the, uh, the advocacy uh, journey and the lessons learned and how we came together as a movement. Uh, I'd be happy to maybe do a separate small session explaining what the current regulations are. I, I'm not sure if I can do it now, uh, but if, if your program uh, has that kind of flexibility, then maybe just half an hour one day, and I'd be happy to cover that. But it is, it is absolutely possible. It is not complicated. Uh, the provisions now are fairly simple you can have uh, some amount of uh, pain relief medicine, some amount of essential narcotic medicines on you if you're a doctor for your patient's use. If you'd like to have more, then you are permitted to have more from the state drug controller. And if you'd like to have a dedicated institution, either for pain relief and palliative care purposes 
or even for uh, drug dependence purposes, then you can apply to the state drug controller to grant you a certificate as a recognized medical institution. Once you get that, all you need to do is submit a basic estimate of what quantity of uh, essential narcotic drugs do you need um, and submit that and then start getting the medicines from uh, legitimate uh, suppliers. Um, you also will have to keep records of, you know, patient forms and how much medicine is uh, in stock and how much medicine was dispensed in that day. But those are not, not very complicated. And I'm sure some of you who are in the palliative care units now are already doing it. So it's, it is not complicated as far as actually doing the things is concerned. The complication has been, and this is something that we have been working together for the last several years, that that resistant mindset and attitude still prevails. So while the rules are uniform, some states and some state drug controllers are still being very difficult. And they are posing one obstruction after another, including those that, that are not contemplated in the NDPS Act or the NDPS rules. And once one uh, state where uh, Parliament has been working very closely, Uttarakhand is coming to mind, where they're just, you know, bringing new things out of the blue uh, in requirements for you to have an RMI certificate, which are not part of the, um, the Act or the rules. So that's, that difficulty still remains. But as far as the paperwork and the uh, provisions are concerned, it is not too complicated now. Thank you, ma'am. I just want to add to that, uh, Tripti, that uh, yes, we will definitely make time for, an, for a half an hour presentation. I think uh, we'll work that out between the group and you, because I feel that that will be extremely valuable to all of us uh, to hear it from you directly. Uh, and also, Shri Vidya, we have the protocols. Uh, we have the forms and the and the SOPs basically for how to access an RMI um, or to get yourself uh, an RMI. And uh, post this session, uh, that will be one of the learning materials we will send out to everybody. So you can have a read through and then perhaps the next time when we have a Tripti session, if there are, if there are any specific questions uh, that can be sent to us in advance so we can uh, forward them to Tripti and she can sort of work those doubts into the next presentation perhaps so we'll happily send we'll send you all that material thank you ma'am thank you very much thank you ma'am thank you sri vidya uh, shalini yeah uh, i just wanted uh, firstly uh, thank you so much tripti this uh, story of ndps is always uh, as alluring you know every time i hear from you uh, again the way we have moved on and come to this stage, uh, I think this was, again, very informative and kind of revised all the journeys that we have heard so far. Uh, and, uh, you know, going to the next level of implementation of this rule and how the, what are the current challenges, as Sri Vidya has asked, uh, one of some of the things I plan to cover in the government advocacy session also, wherein we can share the forms that they are supposed to submit and whom to contact. I was planning to touch upon that, but uh, if Smriti and the group agrees, uh, then, you know, one of the, we have two government advocacy sessions in one of them, if uh, Smriti, you can join in and, uh, you know, collectively we can kind of uh, share, like I can share the field experience and you can uh, talk about the laws and the exact laws and the exact uh, paras where those uh, particular information is there. You know, we can collectively do that. Uh, of course, they can share the whole documents with the, with the whole group. But actually, the implementation of the law is something that each one of them would be required to work with. How to approach, how, what forms to offer. Even if an uh, institution is asking for, how can I get uh, EMs? So they'll have to tell them. So if, uh, you know, all of you and the, the programmers and the organizers at uh, ECHO and Pallium India agrees, uh, you can be part of one of that session. I think that will answer Sri Vidya's question more in detail. 
Yes, absolutely. We can we can coordinate that, Shalini. And uh, thanks for making that suggestion. We'll we'll work that out. Uh, we'll just figure out how uh, Tripti and your time can be divided up, and if Tripti is available on those dates as well. So we'll so we'll work behind the scenes on that. Um, also, I just wanted to mention to all the participants that uh, we have um, we have asked all our regional, our national uh, level officers. Uh, basically, we run a national outreach program in Palium, India, where we work with different states. Shalini has been extremely active uh, in that role for, for two years and has a lot of experience, which is why we invited her to come and talk about government advocacy. So you'll be hearing a lot about her experience. Uh, but at the moment, we also have a few other officers uh, handling different regions. And uh, uh, some of them are here listening to this conversation. We've all agreed to be uh, silent observers for now. But as we go along, we will be introducing our uh, regional officers to all of you. So uh, any advocacy work required at the government, state level, uh, or uh, you know, in any other capacity, uh, we have officers who can who can join you in your region and help you with that. So. Um, so I'll be introducing them to you uh, at probably at the next session or so, and then um, and then even at the state level we can we can connect and proceed with some advocacy work. In fact, we had some wonderful uh, progress with Samira yesterday in the Pondicherry region. So I think that's a beautiful synergy of Arohan and uh, the National Outreach Program coming together. So, so thank you, and that's something for all of us to look forward to. Sorry. So next question, next comment. Shankar. Shankar, sir. I wanted to thank you for the nice lucid presentation, madam. Are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. We are. And I got two questions. One is the awareness in the leading hospitals in India is lacking with respect to NDPS Act. They are not even aware of uh, this act. And uh, is there any program for making it the awareness program? This is one thing. Second is hemp seeds is it a part of property drug? Second question I didn't get, sir. Hemp seeds, there is this called hemp seeds, which is a product of narcotic base. Is it allowed in India for use? Okay. Um, so may I answer? Did yes, you... yes, ma'am, you can answer. Yeah, um, in terms of uh, the awareness in uh, hospitals about the NDPS Act, you're absolutely right. The perception everywhere, including within the government, within uh, the uh, hospital and health system, is that NDPS is a crime. It's a law and order problem, law and order issue. It's got nothing to do with uh, health and nothing to do with patients and nothing to do with doctors. So that perception is something that um, Palium India and others are slowly changing by taking this issue uh, up front, going and working with the health system within the Department of Health uh, in, in, at the central level, as well as in state governments and in different institutions. And I think if we were to really strengthen the health part of this law, which like I said, is now part of the law, it's an, as much as important as preventing illicit use. Uh, it's at the same footing that we should be able to really move forward on this. That's when a lot of the myths and misconceptions about prescribing opioids for medical use or stocking them with doctors or uh, giving them to patients, all those myths and fears will probably uh, uh, go away if there's more awareness on this. In terms of your second question about whether hemp seeds uh, are allowed, this is uh, something that uh, you know many people have shown uh, interest in. So, um, if you see, there is uh, the NDPS Act has a definition of cannabis, and that definition uh, says that cannabis is either uh, called which is the more refined uh, um, parts of, of the cannabis or hemp plant. And then there's something called ganja, which is a slightly milder uh, version, less refined. But it says that seeds are excluded. 
So the seeds of the hemp plant are not considered cannabis under the NDPS Act. But there are also other, just like I was trying to explain that morphine comes under many categories, manufacture, narcotic, derivative, preparation, this, that. Similarly, cannabis also has uh, 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 falls under several other categories. So there is uh, something called um, medicinal hemp. And uh, one second, let me just cross check this. Yeah, it's called, sorry, medicinal cannabis, which doesn't say whether it includes the seeds or excludes the seeds. It, it simply says uh, any extract or tincture of cannabis hemp. So seeds per se may be excluded, but anything that you derive from the seeds for medicinal purposes may still be covered. So um, I, I think it's, it's a little more complicated um, and, and this is an area that needs work. So if, if patients are interested in exploring uh, medicinal properties of cannabis or if uh, doctors are interested or medical researchers are interested, then this is something that I think should be, should be done. Because like I said, the law has provisions for it. Those provisions have not been put to use. So I don't see any reason why progress on this should stall any further. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Shankar, sir. Uh, so, Raji, if I can just add a little bit. Yes, you can. Shankar, sir, just wanted to share particularly about creating awareness. I think Pallium India is leading uh, deliverable has been that that we are trying to create awareness at all levels about the medical use of opioids and uh, their requirement. Just to take away the opiophobia in the minds of medical fraternity, we reach out to medical institutes, hospitals, try to create awareness there. We try to approach the government, talk to the state government, uh, state drug controllers, the other uh, bureaucrats involved, and share with them about these laws. And for them, we always invite experts like Tripti and uh, there are a few other experts who have been working in this field with Dr. Raj Gopal. So there have been a lot of uh, workshops that have been held, which are called opioid accessibility workshops in the government sector, as well as in the medical institutes. But uh, again, we need more and more hands and people doing the same job so that more awareness can be created at all levels. Thank you, Shalini ma'am. Uh, so, uh, Samira? Just a comment in the continuation of what uh, the narcotic drugs and the discussion related to that was going on. So, what I could say that uh, Tripti had mentioned six drugs in the list, okay, in her presentation. So, as a doctor and you know, as an anesthetist, using narcotics very common in the practice, there are a few other drugs also included in the category of narcotics, which uh, can have application uh, quite a lot. Okay, like for example, uh, Tripti mentioned about tramadol. Uh, other drugs like buprenorphine, okay, is also one essential important drug, which is a partial agonist, antagonist drug. But definitely it has got some amount of role in acute and chronic pain management. Now, inducing the changes related to that, understanding related to these drugs, which do not fall into, uh, uh, you know, categories of uh, what drugs have been classically described under this act, uh, can really benefit to the medical community. That yes, these drugs are available. You can strategize, uh, you can make, uh, you know, uh, disease related or the condition related uh, use of these drugs. Like for example, morphine you have, uh, very stepwise approach uh, towards breathlessness or towards pain and uh, morphine uh, use or pethidine use or codeine use. The same way the other drugs like buprenorphine uh, can also get incorporated. So even though these drugs are not categorized under those uh, that bracket of uh, the law, these drugs can get utilized into it. Somehow being uh, part and parcel of learning process going through the medical education 
and practicing later on as an anesthesiologist i learned that there is a quite a lot amount of fear being implemented or inducted or induced in your mind as a doctor as an anesthetist all throughout my practice i still remember oh my god opioid i have to go on to so many signatures signing i have to report it so you know a very negative impact comes at the user end even towards the doctors so these also issues also had to be uh, nullified and definitely a lot of advocacy is needed uh, for that purpose also okay second thing about is uh, it's just an overall uh, comment uh, uh, about like uh, you know, tripti's presentation which was there about what i could perceive is uh, it, it's really a difficult task when a law gets uh, you know implemented but when it comes to a change in that legal process it's such a headache i mean it, the time goes off the energy is like enormous amount of energy is gone behind that and uh, i just want to take an opportunity at this moment to uh, you know uh, induce or stimulate to all of you about a recent law or a bill which is going to get proposed into the parmil parliament is about transgender bill 2019 okay so quite a lot of things are been happening uh, as tripti completely said that once it is formed changing and making a reform is something which is a huge mammoth task and something a law something which is going to be imparted which is actually meant for the community but it is not going to benefit for transgender community and absolutely a huge negative impact it is going to happen so quite a lot of advocacy is going to happen in this direction is going to be taken place uh, the moment the law gets put forward into the parliament so i just want to take uh, this as an opportunity on this forum uh, will something be like that can be uh, done on this forum to the help of this forum uh, when this law gets you know uh, sanctioned or come up on the parliament that's it yes i mean absolutely i think uh, first of all thank you for bringing our attention to it i don't think uh, without you we would have you know we would have uh, we have we would have known uh, most certainly uh, i think uh, we can we can commit to backing backing you in in whatever efforts are required so um, so probably what we will need is for you to educate us a little bit more about the implications of this and uh, so so perhaps at another time we can figure out a way to do that so that we know exactly what it is that we're grappling with and like tripti and everybody did uh, identify what the problem is identify what needs to be uh, what needs to be chased down and uh, what are the different options or solutions that need uh, to be generated and who can we engage among civil society amongst different stakeholders so i think uh, we we at palium india will be happy to happy to assist with that can i just um spriti can i just add uh, the another response to both uh, her points i think uh, on on the issue of other medicines like tramadol and buprenorphine all other medicines which have a role in pain management so these medicines are uh, classified as psychotropic substances and the regulatory system for psychotropic medicines is very different from narcotic uh, drugs so um, you know that's why you can't bring them under the end category because they're not narcotic drugs they're psychotropic but it's her question is interesting whether one should look at having now that we have you know uniform regulations for the ends should we think of uniform regulations for all narcotic and psychotropic drugs which are used in medical purposes you know that that that's an interesting question right now we don't because the the international requirements differ for narcotic drugs and differ for psychotropics um legal requirements reporting requ requirements all of that is uh, pretty different but uh, you know we could at least in india think of a way that everything which is classified under ndps and has medical use should 
could perhaps be streamlined. Um, on, on, on the other question about the transgender bill, yes, that's, that's something that the Lawyers Collective is also actively um, working on and critiquing. I just want to make a broad point. You know, as, as lawyers involved in not just court, but also in developing and framing and critiquing laws, there, there, there are broadly two approaches to bear in mind. One is to say that whatever has to be said, let it be in the law once and for all, so that you don't have the hassle of going to different government and machinery for doing this, doing that, doing that. Let it all be laid down in the law once and for all, and let everything be clear. There are advantages to that, but there are also disadvantages because everything then becomes black and white and rigid. So for any small change, you have to go back to the doors of parliament and, you know, get them to, to pass an amendment. The other approach is to have the law as a very basic skeletal framework and leave all the details of oper operationalization to rules and regulations and, and guidelines, which is something which has been done with the recent HIV and AIDS Prevention and Control Act, where the law is just a broad skeletal framework and rest everything is through guidelines. Now the advantages of that is certainly flexibility, but the disadvantage is that if the administration is not interested or is lethargic or doesn't want to implement, then they can just stall everything by sitting on it, by not issuing regulations, not issuing guidelines and SOPs. And so both these approaches um, are, you know, are useful as well as uh, difficult. But uh, since you brought up the transgender bill and you also brought up the other questions about how much should we regulate through law and how much should be through loser instruments, I think it's, it's something to think about. Uh, uh, Tripti, I had one question. Um, and uh, the ENDs that the central government has listed, those five or six, um, from what I understand, two are not even available in India, right? Now, the question I had is, uh, is this, does this form a minimum essential list that states can build on? Or because uh, I think Kerala has a few other drugs added to the list. Uh, but is this the minimum that the country has to follow or it's variable from state to state? Like a state can choose not to have methadone on its list is is that is that something that happens or is this stipulated as a minimum bare, bare minimum this is stipulated by the central government states can't make any change to it and um, i'm aware that you know two of those are not even available which just goes on to show that the inputs for listing drugs as essential narcotic drugs didn't really come from Health administration in the country, it, it perhaps came from other other sources. I, I don't want to comment on that. No, um, but uh, um, but uh, what states can do? So, for instance, if uh, Kerala has certain drugs in mind, then you know states like Kerala, which already had a good regulatory system for manufactured drugs then they can continue to use those. So, so, you know, this is the beauty of the changes that we brought about. Essential narcotic drugs. So if you're on the list, you follow the central rules. But if you're not on that list, it doesn't mean that the other rules don't apply. You will be governed by the state rules. And if the state rules are good, as they were in Kerala, then you shouldn't really have a problem. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, last few questions. Shantanu sir. Shantanu. Uh, Shantanu sir, you can speak. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? My network is not good. Yeah. Uh, I am uh, facing a, a strange problem, you know. I don't know whether... Can't hear. Sir, we can hear you. You can speak. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I am facing a strange problem. I don't know whether it's relevant to with this discussion or 
Hello, sir. It's us. It's us. We got the license for essential narcotic drugs. And for having a normal drug license. Oh, it's not working. Sir, we can hear you. Oh, it's not audible. Maybe I will mail that. Uh, sir, then you can put in the, in the chat option. Uh, did you? Yes, 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 yes. I will, I will, I will, I'm writing that. Uh, meanwhile, somebody else needs to talk. Ajay? Yes, Ajay, you can speak. Uh, actually, I uh, just want to thank. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not much uh, related to this topic, uh, but uh, it, 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 uh, I, I could learn more from this advocacy. Uh, uh, how much? Uh, how much documents and so much things which are uh, related to that. Uh, I just uh, uh, from this palliative care, I came to know that they used to tell me that they are able to supply these uh, drugs to the patients because here in this Atabalam, they are also treating the other patients who are mentally retarded uh, patients also they are treating so so i from the palliative care volunteers i came to know that they are uh, uh, they uh, they are able to supply the essential medicines to the patients so so uh, so now from this uh, uh, from the madam stock uh, i came to understand that how it became possible for these uh, drugs to uh, to came to our clinic so so i just want to thank for the whole process and uh, thank you so much for the information thank you thank you ajay anybody else wish to talk Can I um, can I take your leave? My phone battery is dying, so I'm going to just <laughs> it just disappear. So, is it okay if I take your leave now? Yes. Asha. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tuti, for that wonderful session. I've been hearing about you from uh, the day when I joined Palim India with Dr. Ashoka, but this is the first time I, I could see you, at least online. Uh, nice to see you, and thank you so much for the session. And thank you. Have a great weekend, all of you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Ritti. Thanks, everybody. So we can see you on next Saturday with a topic on communication and messaging. So I have given the feedback. So please do for our next Saturday. Thank you. Bye-bye.